Dr. Shalki Harb is a retired surgeon. He was born in Ramallah. Um, uh, he was born in Ramallah, studied at some of the most advanced centers in the world, then returned to Ramallah where he spent decades working and running Ramallah Hospital. He now lives in Farmington, Utah with his wife Heidi and near two of their sons and their families. Tonight he'll be discussing his book, A Surgeon Under Israeli Occupation. I call his book, quote, part personal memoir, part narrative of the evolution of medical practice in Palestine, and part description of the Palestinian Nakba. It's an important contribution to the documentation of the vibrancy of Palestinian culture amidst Israeli settler colonial apartheid and ethnic cleansing attempts to destroy their culture. The power of nonviolent resistance and struggle for full political, civil, and human rights. Shauki, it's a real privilege and delight for us to be welcoming you to Fort Wayne, please. Well, thank you, Michael, for your nice introductory words. Uh, I hope you will be able to understand my foreign accent, but uh, you can interrupt me anytime and ask questions. My book, A Surgeon Under Israeli Occupation, is not only a personal narrative. It talks about the context within that narrative took place and evolved. The cover of the book, you see it in the, here, whereby, so this is the cover page of my book, in which Israeli soldiers tried to enter the hospital to arrest wounded young Palestinians, because they claim they were involved in uh, throwing stones at Israeli tanks. I told them that according to the Article 4 of the Geneva Convention, you cannot do that. That's when I got the first blow on my head, and I actually got nose bleeding. And they forced their way into the hospital and arrested several people. Next slide. In the yellow here, you see, first of all, you see the blue Mediterranean to the left of the map. The yellow piece is the West Bank, which the Palestinians tried to claim as a state, as an independent and free state, whereby the Israelis are uh, filling it with new settlements, very often uh, actually uh, enforcing the uh, confiscation of Palestinian land. In the middle of this blue strip is the city of Ramallah, where I was born. Next slide. Please. This is not Ramallah. This is Heidelberg, where I went to medical school. And I brought it to tell you a very interesting phenomenon. When I was there, one time and after a, a debate, probably it was political, I was approached by a couple of German-looking persons. And they right away told me that they were of the Jewish religion, which I told them, yes, I have many Jewish friends. But they added they were actually part of the Nazi army. They were actually employed, uh, one of them, uh, the man was in a, in a tank, Panzer division, and his wife actually was a secretary in a Panzer division also. And he actually fought on the Russian front. They looked blonde. They did not look uh, Semitic like I do. 
So I doubted uh, their, their story till I found a book by a Jewish guy with the name of Riggs titled Jewish uh, Soldiers uh, in Hitler's Army. And I got the book and read it. And indeed, there were very influential Jewish soldiers in Hitler's army, including high-ranking officers. So this was, for me, a learning experience. Next, please. This is Michael DeBeke, my mentor, where I had my uh, thoracic and cardiovascular training. Michael DeBeke, as you know, is of uh, uh, Lebanese ancestry, and he hardly spoke any Arabic. But when I went to him, I told him I am leaving to go back to my hometown, Ramallah, under Israeli occupation. He looked at me, surveyed me from above to down, and said, are you majnoon? In Arabic, majnoon means, are you crazy? <laughs> Maybe it was a crazy decision, but that's what I did. Next, please. <clears throat> Ramallah is known for two things. The first one, it's a school system, which was established, by the way, by the American Quakers. Already in 1869, American Quakers came to Palestine and established schools. The most famous two schools was one in Lebanon, in Brumana, and the other one was in Ramallah. And this is the entrance to one of these schools. Next. The second thing for which Ramallah uh, was famous is the hospital system. And as you see, <coughs> you see some snow. Ramallah, the city, is about uh, 1,500, oh, well, 1,000 feet above the sea level. And during the winter, very often we have heavy snowfalls. And to give you an idea how heavy these snowfalls could be, in 1883, Russian pilgrims walking from Nazareth to Jerusalem just before Eastern, following the steps of Jesus Christ, they were caught in a snow storm just north of Ramallah. Many of them died due to hypothermia. The Ramallah people, including some of my ancestors, went and picked them up and tried to revive some of them, but most of them died, and they are still buried in the Orthodox cemetery in Ramallah. Cemetery in Ramallah. Next. To give you an idea about the situation when I was in Ramallah, I'm showing you, I'd like to show you a video strip of a, an interview I had uh, on the ABC program uh, 2020, quite a few years ago. Please, if you could run the strip. Our next topic tonight is the Middle East, more specifically a controversial report on Arabs living on the Israeli-occupied West Bank, a report that appeared on the ABC News magazine program 2020. The program came under heavy criticism from the Israeli government and American Jewish organizations. The Israeli government called it bias, a series of gross distortions and misrepresentations, and added that it contained vicious slanders against Israeli authorities. The Israelis also charged that there was a motive for that ABC report, namely to appease the Palestine Liberation Organization because of alleged threats and intimidation of ABC News correspondents in Beirut. Here now are some excerpts from the broadcast and the question as reported by ABC News correspondent Tom Jarrell. The argument is over possession of the West Bank land these men are standing on. I will not give up my property. Come and shoot me, I will not be quiet. This is my property, my life. I have titles to prove this land is mine. 
Under military occupation, the Arab farmer will lose. The Israeli settler is backed up by the army, and so the big earth movers dig in. Regardless of who is right about the land, this settlement has plans to triple in size. The settlements are built to be permanent. This is the settlement of Kiryat Arba, one of several small cities the Israelis are putting up on the West Bank. Some are meant to house up to 50,000 people. We are witnessing, in my opinion, the final phases of the liquidation of Palestine. And it is being done now, acre after acre. The 30 years of conflict with hostile Arab neighbors erupting three times into full-scale war provide the Israelis with their strongest argument for more and bigger settlements. The argument that the West Bank is vital to Israeli security as a buffer zone against attacking Arab armies. Military occupation means day-to-day -day restriction and harassment for Palestinians. The Israelis say it's all necessary because of terrorism that's a fact of life on the West Bank. For example, the machine gunning of Jewish settlers in the Arab city of Hebron in 1980. The Palestinians charge it's frequently the army that escalates the violence and that the occupying soldiers are sometimes trigger happy. They point to this example, a demonstration by high school girls in Ramallah in 1980, which ended in bloodshed when Israeli troops opened fire. Four demonstrators were wounded. The military government says rock throwing provoked the soldiers to open fire. The infant mortality rate is going down almost everywhere in the world. But on the West Bank, say Palestinian doctors, it's actually going up. The Israelis have figures to dispute this. But at the Ramallah hospital, Dr. Harb claims there's a shocking situation. Well, I'll tell you something. All babies who need respirators in this hospital, they die. Because we don't have simply baby respirators. And these are well, a lot. The Israelis say there is one baby respirator at the Ramallah hospital, but that's not nearly enough, according to independent medical experts. At Hadassah, for example, an Israeli hospital serving about the same size population, there are 10 baby respirators. The Jordan Valley, an arid zone where the key to prosperity and even survival is water, and where Arabs are almost never allowed to dig wells. There was a drought in 1979. The natural spring at El Aja dried up. Israeli military authorities did nothing to help the village. The villagers requested the permission to drill a village well. The answer was no. While this was going on, the Israelis had more than enough water to irrigate their fields. Enough water, as a matter of fact, for a swimming pool at the nearby settlement. The Palestinians charged the Israelis continue to rob them of their water by pumping out through the exclusive Israeli pipelines a resource far more precious on the West Bank than oil. Water, if you can listen down there, you'll find here a big pipe under us. It is uh, about 25 inch diameter, roaring water. It is our water, we cannot touch it. It goes straight to the settlements which are around us. <clears throat> Thank you. Next slide. Of course, it was an impossible uh, situation for the Palestinian population. What's happening to the Palestinians by the uh, Israeli occupation forces? And the reaction most of the time came from school kids who encountered <coughs> tanks with stone throwing. The result, next slide, please. The Israelis first started using plastic, the so-called plastic bullets. And these uh, uh, bullets actually caused havoc because if they penetrate the chest, they would cause cardiac injuries and most of the time uh, death. The Israelis realizing that the number of uh, killed Palestinian children was too high they were ordered to aim at the legs. And the result, next please. 
very often these uh, bullets would hit vessels in the lower extremities. And if they come late to the hospital, they will end up of, uh, with amputations, bilateral amputation, like in this child. And there were many, many of these uh, children. Next. They also used, they stopped using the plastic bullets because there was international pressure, including US pressure, not to use them. They are contraband by the Geneva Convention. They start using rubber bullets. They call them rubber bullets. It's a euphemism of this metallic. I opened one of them to show the inside of the bullet. And of course, if they hit the head from a small, uh, from a short distance, they can cause uh, uh, permanent brain damage. Next. And this picture appeared in, uh, in the German Stern magazine a long time ago, just showing one of these children who was hit in a rubber bullet in his head, was admitted to the Ramallah hospital. Unfortunately, uh, the, this boy uh, stayed with permanent uh, brain damage, irreversible, and he later on died. Next, please. <clears throat> the confrontation between Palestinian children and Israeli forces was happening hour by hour and day by day. Everywhere there were children fighting the Israeli tanks, and the Israelis were responding with uh, live fire, with machine guns sometimes. And this caused a lot of psychological problems among Palestinian children, including insomnia, not going to schools, nightmares, and post-traumatic distress syndromes. Next. This slide shows you uh, the prevalence uh, of, uh, of uh, nightmares among Palestinian children. The study was done actually by my daughter-in-law also, who is Austrian. That's why you see the name Harb, it is not me. <coughs> Next. In spite of all of these conditions, we were able in 1987 to perform successfully the first open heart sur surgery. The doctors and the nurses among you might be surprised if I tell them that when I did the first open heart surgery, when, when we started open heart surgery, we did not have actually intensive care units. We just have to make a bed, a makeshift bed to, to mimic an intensive care unit. And usually me or one of my assistants will stay with the uh, child or with the, we did a lot of congenitals, with the child or the patient after surgery till he was extubated or she was extubated. Next. After the heart surgery, the first heart surgery in Palestine, I got a letter from this gentleman. He was a member of the Israeli Knesset. His name is Meir Kahane. In this letter, show the letter, please, now. next. In Hebrew and in Arabic. He's asking me to leave the country. But if I decide not to leave the country, I could stay as a slave for the Jewish people. And this is literally literal translation of what he wrote in Hebrew. If I refuse these two options, then the Jewish people, Israel, will declare war against me. So I actually refused uh, to, to accept the letter and I decided to stay at that time. Next. 
But this was not the only thing, the intimidation. Here you see a religious Israeli, you know, recognized by the cap on, on the head, a religious boy, kicking a Palestinian woman while his mother is dragging her scarf. She was going to prayer in the, in, in the mosque. Next, please. <clears throat> this took place <clears throat> in the city of Hebron, where the Ibrahim Mosque is also located. And it is contested by the Muslims as well as by the Jews. Next. This gentleman, Baruch Goldstein, takes his machine gun, enters that mosque while uh, people were praying, and he kills on the spot 29 uh, worshippers. 35 of them, 35 more worshippers were wounded, mostly in the back and thus in the chest. And they were transferred to Ramallah Hospital where I worked, because this was the only chest center in the Palestinian uh, area. And I remember we went into the operating room on Friday afternoon in 1996, and I went out of the operating room with my team on Tuesday. Thank God we did not lose a single patient. However, many of them, one of them actually, who had injury to the esophagus and the trachea, but also to the spinal cord, was uh, quadriplegic, and, uh, uh, but he survived. Next, please. Now this is Ramallah with the Palestinian flag. This is after the Palestinian Authority uh, took over. My son Tariq, who is an invasive cardiologist, is was visiting and he decided to have this picture done, which is of interest. It shows lots of concrete buildings. Unfortunately, it is nipping on the farmland. Next. And this is uh, Yasser Arafat visiting the Ramallah Hospital when I was the director of the hospital. I happened to have met Yasser Arafat in 19, for the first time in 1970 when I did with other American uh, doctors volunteer work in Jordan during the civil strife. And at that time he told me that we are going to meet in Palestine. He was at that time in Dara, in the town of Dara in Syria. Well, I did not believe him. Uh, but in, indeed, he came to Ramallah and reminded me, didn't I tell you we were going to meet in Palestine? <laughs> Next. That's it? Okay. You know, I talked about the first intifada where many children were maimed and the effects of the strife on the children, on their behavior. But there was a second intifada. I remember my wife and I woke up on the sound of rambling tank, tanks from down, you know, down from our house. And we went on the roof to look. And it was during the night. And there were tanks rolling uh, along the dirt roads from all sides of the city of Ramallah. And they start shooting. This house is not far away from the house where I used to live. And they were, were hearing the sound of explosions and the rumbling of tanks approaching our house. Next. Getting closer to our house. Next. And then my wife was able to take a picture from the window of our house to that tank, uh, I hope you can see it, 
just across from our house. Next. While Israeli soldiers entered the house and closed the gate and the tank which they were manning was still there. Then they entered the house and asked one of them, uh, first of all, they uh, took my German wife aside and put her in a, uh, one room and closed the windows and the shutters. And I thought it, it was the end. And then <clears throat> one Israeli soldier put his M16 in my back and asked me to go from one room to the other. I was then afraid that the Israeli soldier might pull the trigger, even if it is a mistake, because very often episodes like this happened uh, somewhere else. And we hear next day in the newspaper that uh, the guy who was uh, pushed by the, by the gun tried to take the gun from the soldier. And when I was pushed at the tip of the gun, I was afraid that if I do any mistake, he might shoot. And it was a terrifying experience. I tried to calm him, but he would push with the tip every time I tried to calm him. In spite of this, we had an Israeli officer who was known to be notorious by shooting Palestinian children, whenever he sees them, maybe while throwing stones. One day, I was called in the middle of a curfew by, by the resident on call at the hospital, telling me that, come right away, we have an Israeli soldier, officer, uh, shot in the chest, and he's bleeding heavily, and we are wheeling him to the operating room. I was the only chest surgeon around, and I had to go through the care field. And we, we knew at that time any care field breaker, because that Israeli soldier was a care field breaker for, for the checkpoint. They thought it was a Palestinian car. So I was afraid that they would think that I'm also a care field breaker and will shoot at me. So I put the flashlights on and, and hurried to the hospital where I found this soldier and I had to operate on him and uh, saved his life. So I got a telephone call from the uh, Israeli Defense Minister, Ahrens, who thanked me and asked me, what do I want? I told him politely to get out of Ramallah. <laughs> He did not comply, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I hope uh, I was able to convey the message I wanted to. And if you have any questions, I will be m most delighted. Of course, the book actually talks in details about all of these incidents and others.